Um, yeah, so welcome to the um, first talk of the session. We're going to have Hamoun uh, Musavi talk about non-local games, compression theorems, and the arithmetical hierarchy. Okay, take it away. So yes, hi everyone. Um, yes, the talk is going to be non about non-local games. Uh, I'm going to tell you about computational problems associated with these games uh, and their relative hardness. This is joint work with my brilliant co-author, Sajjad Nejadi, who is a second year PhD student at the University of Maryland, and Henry Yuan. So let's uh, begin with the simplest of non-local games, the CHSS game. You may have heard of this game before. It is played between a referee and uh, two cooperating players, Alice and Bob. Uh, the referee samples uh, a pair of questions, X and Y, for Alice and Bob, and Alice and Bob cannot communicate with one another once the game starts. So Alice only sees question X, and Bob only sees question Y. And uh, the players then each respond with a bit. And the winning condition for the game is that the sum of their responses modulo two uh, should be equal to the question, the product of the questions they received. The details of this doesn't matter for the rest of the talk. I just want you to get the high level idea of what a non-local game is by this example. Now let's talk about strategies that Alice and Bob can employ to play this game. Um, a strategy, or if you want to be precise, a tensor product, a strategy S, consists of uh, two finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, HA for Alice and HB for Bob, and a state psi in the tensor product of these two Hilbert spaces, together with uh, a bunch of measurement operators, uh, one for each uh, Alice's question, uh, that act on the Hilbert space HA, and similarly, measurement operators for Bob. Now, with these at hand, uh, the winning probability of this strategy I denoted by omega. And then I'm going to define the value of a game, which here is denoted by omega star of CHSH. We're going to talk about this value a lot for the rest of the talk. So this is defined to be the supremum of winning probabilities over all tensor product strategies S. Now, there, it is well known that there is a strategy with uh, just two-dimensional Hilbert spaces uh, with winning probability 0.85 for this game. It is also well known that this simple two-dimensional strategy is uh, really the best the players can do in, in this game. But that is really not, that, not something that is immediately obvious. Um, why couldn't Alice and Bob go to a larger dimensional Hilbert space and use some very complicated measurement operators and win the game with a probability that is strictly larger than 0.85? Well, we are lucky that CHSH is a simple game, uh, and with some mathematical ingenuity, we can, in fact, show that this 0.85 and the two-dimensional strategy are the optimal play for this game. But what about a game that is uh, much more complicated? A game with a larger question set, a larger answer set, and very, very complicated game rules. So this motivates um, the following question. Given a game, how hard it is to compute its value? From our prelim preliminary discussion um, on the CHSH game, we know that intuitively this should be a hard problem. And in fact, this matches the theory. Slavstra in 2016 showed us that uh, the value of a game is uncomputable, meaning that there is no algorithm that succeeds on every single game. Then a few la years later, uh, the result MIP star equals RE came out, and the content of that theorem is that even approximating this value is, uh, is, is not possible. Even that is uncomputable. To be precise, Approximating the value omega star g up to ha half um, is, 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 even that is something that we cannot hope to do. Then, begs the question, uh, is that the end of the story? 
Well, I hope I can tell you that, I can, I can show it to you in this talk that um, there, there are some other very interesting things that are going on. Uh, we will see that on computable problems, like the two problems that I just mentioned, the approximate uh, calculation of the value and exact computation, are, can be uncomputable in incomparable ways. And this distinction, this uncom incomparability, uh, can give us some interesting new insight about entanglement and the fine-grained structure of quantum correlations. But first, I need to uh, give you a crash course on computability theory. So this is the theory that, that gives us the language to uh, talk about the degree of uncomputability of problems and their relative hardness. Um, you most likely have seen uh, the halting uh, problem. Um, it's a decision problem, meaning that I have uh, two sets. The set of yes instances uh, are all those Turing machines that halt, and the set of no instances are those that uh, do not halt. And if you're not familiar with Turing machine for the rest of the talk, think about a C program or a Python program. It's just all the same. Then the halting problem is asking us, given a Turing machine, uh, whether it's a yes instance or it's a no instance. Uh, the halting problem is, it's well known that it's uh, uncomputable. There is another problem called non-halting, where I just switch the labels yes and no. So for example, the yes instances are now uh, the set of Turing machines that do not halt. Since I just switched the labels, obviously this problem is also uncomputable. Um, but, uh, these two problems are fundamentally different. And they are different in the sense that uh, there's no way you can reduce one to the other. And uh, what is um, reduction anyway? Reduction is an algorithm. Uh, the reduction, a reduction between two problems is an algorithm that sends yes instances to yes instances and no instances to no instances. And Take my word for it that uh, there is no reduction from the halting problem to the non-halting problem, nor there is a reduction in the other direction. Now, I'm going to define, to you, uh, define for you a, a problem that we're going to see a lot in, for the rest of the talk. It's called the exact value problem. It's another decision problem. The yes instances are all those games that have value one, and the no instances are games with value strictly less than one. Slavstra showed that exact value problem is uncomputable by a reduction from the non-halting problem. I hope knowing that this reduction exists it is clear to you that exact value is uncomputable. For if I could solve exact value, then I could immediately solve non-halting, and we know that that's not possible. So that um, is the content of this theorem. Now, we also know that we have another problem, uh, the approximate value. Uh, it's very similar to the uh, exact value, that the yes instances are exactly the same, the games with value one. Now the no instances are those games with value strictly less than half. I call this, we call this approximate value problem because if I had um, access to an algorithm that could solve the problem, uh, the com uh, could compute the value of a game approximately, then I could simply solve this decision problem, right? So that's the connection. That's why we call it approximate value. Now, the MIP star equals R, it proved that approximate value is uncomputable. That result proved that uh, this, this problem is uncomputable by a reduction this time from the, from the halting problem. All right, so now here we summarized all the problems we saw so far and the reductions between them. The question is, what other arrows I can immediately draw here? Well, for one thing, we know that approximate computation is never harder than exact computation. So there is a trivial uh, reduction from the approximate value to the exact value. But I'd like to note that this doesn't tell me that exact value is strictly harder than approximate value, at least not yet. For all we know, there could have 
existed a reduction in the other direction from exact value to approximate value, in which case these two problems would have equal hardness. So what I'm going to do uh, in the next few slides is to uh, tell you that this is not possible, to refute the possibility of uh, this reduction existing. So let's, let's see that. First, um, the approximate value problem and halting problem are in fact equivalent. I already told you that halting can be reduced to approximate value, but there is a reduction in the other direction. So uh, let's see that reduction. So unlike the uh, halting to approximate value, which is very difficult to prove, this direction is easy and we can very quickly see that. So uh, the goal is that I'm given a game and I would like to produce a Turing machine. Uh, uh, the Turing machine is as follows. Uh, Enumerate over all dimensions one by one, starting from dimension one, and go over every single strategy of that dimension. And the moment you uh, reach a strategy that has winning probability at least half, stop and accept. There is one little problem, and that's that uh, there are uncountably many strategies even in dimension two. Uh, so, but this, this can be addressed uh, because we're lucky in the sense that all the strategies in a, a given dimension uh, can be discretized. Um, and um, if you trust me, this is uh, something that we, can uh, uh, that, that, that we can resolve. So what is the, what is the, the property of this Turing machine? Uh, it should be clear that uh, the Turing machine halts if and only if the game has value one. So that, that gives me uh, the property that I want for the reduction. And there's a name for this Turing machine. We call it uh, search from below uh, semi-algorithm. It's called search from below because if I follow this, this uh, procedure, I would approach the value of the game from below. And it's called a semi-algorithm because it's only guaranteed to succeed on yes instances, on just half of the instances. On no instances, it loops forever. Now, I promised to show you that, uh, that we cannot reduce exact value to approximate value. So the proof goes by contradiction. Just assume that exact value can be reduced to approximate value. Then following the path from non-halting to the exact value, to the approximate value and then to the halting, I get a reduction from non-halting to halting. And we've already seen that that cannot be the case. We cannot reduce non-halting to halting. So this is a contradiction, therefore the reduction cannot exist. And a corollary of this, an immediate corollary, is that exact value is strictly harder than the approximate value. In fact, it shows that exact value is harder than every single uh, problem listed in this diagram. But we proved that something even stronger is true. Imagine a parallel universe in which uh, you could solve the approximate value problem. Not just that. Imagine you could also solve the non-halting problem and the halting problem. We showed that even in that parallel universe, uh, you cannot solve exact value. To be precise, we showed that exact value is complete for this class of problems called uh, pi two. And uh, I'll describe this to you uh, in a moment. But before we get there, uh, let's just examine some of the assumptions that went into defining strategies for, uh, for non-local games. When I was telling you about um, the strategy for uh, the CHSH game, I said there are two Hilbert spaces, one for Alice, one for Bob, and uh, their shared state, the state psi, is in the tensor product of these two uh, Hilbert spaces. Further, I assume that these Hilbert spaces are finite dimensional. But there is another, this is, this is called a tensor product strategy, as I said before, but there is another model for strategies uh, known as the commuting operator strategy. So a commuting operator strategy consists of a Hilbert space H that could possibly be infinite dimensional. This time I only have one Hilbert space and both Alice and Bob sit in this large Hilbert space and they have, just like before, a unit vector in this uh, Hilbert space and um, 
This time, Alice's operator can act on every corner of this Hilbert space, and similarly for Bob's, there's just one requirement. I would need that Alice's Alice and Bob's operator commute with one another. This uh, guarantees the no communication requirement of non-local games. And, and also gives it the name, the commuting operator strategy. Now, don't ask me how, but I'm told that this model is motivated by quantum field theories. There are, uh, now, now I can define uh, for you uh, the commuting operator value of a game. I just uh, call it co-value. Uh, and it's uh, the, the supremum of winning probabilities over all commuting operator strategies. Uh, and just as an example, for CHSH, this commuting operator value or co-value is the same as the value of the game. A few quick facts. It should be um, immediately clear that omega star can never be larger than omega co, okay? Also, in finite dimension, I can always turn a commuting operator strategy into a tensor product strategy. So there is no distinction in finite dimensions between the two. In fact, for the rest of the talk, I would like you to think of tensor product strategies as the finite dimensional subset of the set of uh, core strategies as indicated by this Venn diagram. All right, so now um, an important question in our field was, was uh, the Searlesson problem that was asking whether um, co-value and the value of all games are the same. An important implication of MIP star equals RE is a resolution to this problem. Uh, it gave uh, an explicit game G for which uh, the commuting operator value is strictly larger than uh, the value. Now, uh, we can ask how hard it is to compute this value, the co-value of a game. You know the drill. Uh, we have uh, the decision problem exact co-value, and we define the yes instances and no instances. And uh, Slavstra in another result showed that uh, this problem is uncomputable by Again, a reduction from the non-halting problem. All right, so uh, something, in fact, something more is known. Uh, we know that these two problems are equivalent. There is a reduction in the other direction. And just like before, this, this other direction is easier to state, and I would like you to see it. Uh, it uses this theorem known as the MPA hierarchy. So what does this theorem say? It says that there is a sequence of semi-definite programs, uh, STP1, STP2, all the way to infinity, such that the values of these STPs approach the value, the commuting operator value of the game from above, as indicated by that uh, plot over there. So now, uh, given a game, I am going to construct a Turing machine as follows. The Turing machine is just going to calculate these STP values one by one, and it rejects the moment it sees that a STP value drops below one. So by the theorem, it should be clear that if the game has value of one, this Turing machine never halts. And this one, this, this Turing machine has a name. It's called the search from above algorithm for the obvious reason or rather search from above semi-algorithm. All right, so let's add this to the diagram that we have. This is you know, all the reductions, and um, it tells us that exact value is uh, strictly harder than all these other problems. Now, I would like you to focus for a moment on the exact value problem and exact co-value problem. So the co-value is uh, a, a, an optimization over the set of all strategies, finite dimensional and infinite dimensional strategies. And the exact value is optimization over just the finite dimensional ones. And given the fact that exact value is strictly harder than exact co-value, it just tells us that the set of um, finite dimensional strategies as a subset of all the strategies is, is harder to optimize over. It's more rebellious than the others, that the set of all of the strategies, all the strategies. Now, for the complexity theorist uh, in the audience, 
in the language of multiprover interactive proofs, uh, this, this is telling us that the complexity of MIP collapses uh, when uh, we go from finite dimensional strategies to uh, commuting operator strategy. In other words, uh, commuting operator provers uh, have more ways to conspire against a finite dimensional uh, prover. All right, let's define two complexity classes. Uh, the first one is called RE. Stands for recursively enumerable. It doesn't matter uh, it having such a weird name. Uh, but it is really defined as the set of all problems uh, with uh, semi-algorithms that um, halt on yes instances. Halting problem is a complete problem for this uh, class, meaning that halting is in RE, and every other problem in RE reduces to it. Then a complement of RE, as, or co-RE, as I wrote it down there, uh, is the set of all problems that have semi-algorithms uh, that are guaranteed to halt on uh, the no instances. And the non-halting problem is um, a complete problem for uh, this class. Now, in this uh, language of these complexity classes, the approximate value problem sits in RE. In fact, it's complete for RE. And the exact co-value uh, is complete for co-RE. And, uh, but where does uh, the exact value problem uh, sit in this uh, Venn diagram? Well, that is complete for, the exact value problem is complete for an entirely uh, new class of problems that uh, strictly contains both RE and co-RE. Uh, it's called Pi2, and uh, there's in fact this hierarchy of uh, uncomputability classes uh, that include harder and harder problems. At the base, we have RE and CoRE, and in the second level, we have uh, Pi2. But there is something missing in this diagram. Uh, so we talked about exact co value, but what about approximating the commuting operator value? We did not talk about that problem. Well, um, the exact computation is uh, never harder than exact computation, so the approximate co-value sits somewhere inside co-RE, uh, but where exactly, we don't know. For all we know, it could be somewhere between PS space and co-RE. And the conjecture is that, in fact, it is complete for co-RE, that exact and approximate computation of the co-value have the same hardness. This is in contrast with exact and approximate value, which have widely different hardness. All right, so here is a simple but important application of our work. Uh, it settles the complexity of non-commutative polynomial optimization problem. So let me begin by um, telling you what commutative polynomial optimization is. We have a bunch of polynomials, real polynomials, uh, and we're maximizing this polynomial P subject to some polynomial inequalities. Uh, it is well known that this problem is NP-hard, and it sits in PS space. The fact that it, is, it sits in PS space, it belongs to PS space, which is just another complicit class, is a consequence of an important foundational theorem in uh, computer science known as the existential theory of reals. Now, the setting of non-commutative optimization is very similar. Except here I have polynomials over uh, non-commutative variables. Think of them as matrices. So I have this optimization problem. Uh, the supremum is taken over all Hilbert spaces, all finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, H, and unit vector psi in H, and Hermitian operators x1 to xn. And those inequalities are now with respect to the cone of positive uh, semi-definite. This problem is now uh, in pi 2 because of our result. And the, the, the way to see that is that value of a game can be expressed as uh, a non-commutative polynomial optimization problem. All right, now let's uh, switch gear and talk about the way we can prove all these uncomputability results and their reductions, right? So I, I talked uh, a lot about uncomputability. And one thing we showed is that all these results can be, uh, can follow in a unified manner from these things called compression theorems. Even the conjectured one uh, 
follows similarly from a corresponding compression theorem. Later on, I will also explain to you that uh, compression theorems are indeed necessary. So the idea of compression goes back to this fantastic work by Xi in 2017. And over the next few years, uh, the techniques that went into proving these uh, theorems and have uh, matured, and eventually they, uh, it led to the uh, uh, result MIP study calls RE. So uh, what are compression theorems? A compression theorem is really just an algorithm. Uh, the input is a game, and the output is a related game uh, that is much simpler. So I have to define what do I mean by related and being simpler? Um, related in the sense that their values are uh, related with one another. So for example, if the value of the original game is one, I want the value of the compressed game to also be one. And simpler in the sense that the complexity of the output game, uh, I want that to be much, much smaller than the complexity of the referee in the original game. All right, uh, there are mm, a few different uh, compression theorems. Uh, I'm going to tell you about one of the compression theorems we've proved in our paper. Uh, to, to formalize all those things that I said in the previous slide, uh, simpler and you know, so on and so forth, I need to talk about families uh, of games. Uh, so in, in fact, uh, compression theorems take a family of games and turn it into another family of games. So here is the statement of the theorem. Given a family of non-local games GN, there exists an efficiently computable uh, family of games G compressed, such that the runtime of referee for GN compressed is much smaller than the runtime of the um, referee in the game GN. Think polylogarithmic for uh, smaller. And, uh, and that their values are related via these two uh, relations. Uh, the details of it doesn't matter. Um, one implication of these relations is that, for example, if the value of the game GN is one, then the value of GN compressed is also one, and uh, vice versa. All right, so let's see uh, this theorem in action. Let's try to uh, re reprove Slavstra's uncomputability result using this compression theorem. So. Uh, this is the result that we'd like to reprove. Uh, that exact value is uncomputable, and we do that by reducing non-halting to exact value. So I'm going to use compression theory to construct for you this, uh, this reduction. Um, this is the first step. What I'm going to do is that, uh, given a Turing machine T, I'll first construct a sequence of games, Gn, one for every positive integer, okay? And here's the simple definition of uh, the game GN. So the nth game in this sequence does the following. The referee first simulates the Turing machine T for n steps. And if T halts, uh, then uh, it outright rejects without even playing the game with the players, okay? This should make sense because what I really want is to take the game, take the Turing machine T and produce a game such that its value is one, if and only if the Turing machine doesn't halt. So if the Turing machine halts the re and the referee catches that, it should reject. Now, if it doesn't reject in the first step, it goes on to the second step in which the referee compresses uh, the game's GN. So it, can, it computes the description of these GN compressed games and then plays with the player uh, the game GN plus one compressed. All right. So this uh, is the definition of the game's GN, and the reduction now is to, given the Turing machine, we construct this sequence of games, and out, we output the first game in this sequence, G1, okay? So all I need to show for, um, is, is that if T halts, T halts if and only if the value of the first game in the sequence is strictly less than one. That's all I need to show. Um, and there are two directions for this. Uh, first, assume that T halts. In fact, say that T halts in three steps. 
So here in this slide, I have a few things. On the top, I have the definition of the game GN so that we recall what the definition is. And on the left, we have uh, the property of the compression theory, uh, theorem that I'm going to use. Um, and we assume that the Turing machine T halts in three steps. So what happens in game G3? Well, the referee would immediately reject because T will halt in the first three steps. And so its value is zero. Now, uh, using the uh, property of the compression theorem, I know that the value of G3 compressed is also strictly less than one. Now, let's, let's go on to game G2. Let's talk about game G2. Well, the referee would not reject in the first step because uh, Turing machine T is not halting in, in two steps. So the value of game G3, uh, G2 is really the same as the value of the game G3 compressed. So using this reasoning, I get that the value of G2 is also strictly less than one. And now if I repeat this arg argument one more time, I obtain that the value of G1 is also strictly less than one. So I'm done with uh, this direction of the proof. Now, imagine that T never halts, okay? Well, if T never halts, then in particular, in game G1, the referee will never reject on, on the first step. So the value of G1 is going to be the same as the value of G2 compressed. So I have this equality. And then by the properties of the compression theorem, I have, a, I have an inequality. If I rearrange the inequality, I would get this simpler form. And now by induction I, uh, and applying this reasoning n times, I would get this other inequality. And now if in this one, I send n go to infinity, the right-hand side uh, goes to zero. And that shows to me that uh, the value of the game G1 is one, which is what I wanted. Now, I told you how to prove, uh, reprove a Slavstra's result, but uh, how about our result? How, how, you, know, you remember I, I told you that there is this pi two and exact value is complete for pi two. Uh, how do we prove that? Well, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into the details of that proof, but the summary, the gist of it is that it combines two compression theorems. Um, one of them is the compression theorem that I just told you about. Uh, we call this the gap, a gapless compression theorem, and I will not explain to you what, I, what, what do we mean by gapless. There is another compression we use, and that is the one that comes from MIP star equals R. That's called a gapped compression theorem, and that's the workhorse of their argument. The meat of their uh, proof is, 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 to, is to prove this compression theorem. That we, then we carefully um, interleave these uh, two compression theorems to obtain a stronger compression theorem. And, and, and this construction is quite non-trivial, but uh, it, it allows us to prove the result that we want, the, the, the hardness of exact value problem. So just in a diagram, that's, uh, you know, uh, there are two compression theorems. One is coming uh, from uh, the uh, gapless compression theorem that I told you about, and the other one from MIP star, combining them and getting the stronger gapless compression. Now, the Slavstra proved his result using um, group theory and approximate representation theory. In particular, he did not use compression theorems at all. What I'm gonna show you, though, is that somewhere deep uh, in his result, there must have been uh, a compression theorem. I'm going to show it to you that if you assume uh, that a reduction such as the one that I wrote there holds, that non-halting, for example, can be reduced to exact co-value, then that implies a compression theorem. Not only you prove it using a compression theorem, but itself is implying a compression theorem. So let's see how that goes. This is the theorem that I'll prove. Given a sequence of games Gn, there exists a single game G compressed such that the co-value of G compressed is one if and only if every single game in the sequence has co-value one. So in a sense, G compressed is, the, its value is encoding the value of an infinite uh, family of games. So this is called a super compression. It's stronger than the compression theorem we saw in, a, uh, in the previous slides. Uh, so how do we prove this theorem? The proof idea is very simple. We first start with uh, the sequence of games, Gn, 
we construct a Turing machine out of this sequence. We call it T of G. Then we have this reduction, right, from non-halting to exact co-value. So I apply this reduction to the Turing machine to obtain another gain. Let's call that G compressed. Uh, from the properties of the reduction, I immediately see that the co-value of the G compressed is one if and only if the Turing machine doesn't halt. And if I have this one more property, uh, I would be able to prove my theorem. If I can show that Turing machine doesn't halt if and only if the value of every game, the co-value of every game in my sequence is one, then I'm done. If I put these things together, I would get the um, uh, theorem. So how do I construct the Turing machine with this property? That like it, it's halting or non-halting in a way encode, encodes the uh, values of the games in the sequence. Well, it's very simple. We, we've already talked about MPI hierarchy. That's what we are going to use. The Turing machine is as follows. It goes over all integers n, and uh, for every m from one to n, it calculates the nth STP in the sequence, in the hierarchy uh, that we saw from before. It calculates that STP value on the game GM. If it ever drops below one, it halts, right? Now it should be very easy to see that. If, the value, if, the, if all of the values of the games, uh, the GNs are one, then this Turing machine never halts. So that's, the, that's the property that I wanted and um, I got it. Now, we saw that these compression theorems can do these interesting things, um, but what, why should you believe that such a thing exists? Like, it's so good uh, to be true. Uh, well, I'm going to just highlight what goes into the proof of a compression theorem, or at least give you an intuition why uh, we should have a compression theorem. So compression is taking this game G and produces another game with a much smaller referee. So that means that you know, uh, the, the, the questions that the referee sends are much smaller, the answers that it receives are much smaller, and the game rules are simpler. Uh, but the compression, compression algorithm does all of these things at the expense of making the provers much, much more difficult and complicated. Meaning that the provers in this new game, in the compressed game, now go, have to go uh, to a larger Hilbert space and use much more complicated measurement operators in order to win with the same winning probability as before. That is exactly the reason why classical games cannot be compressed. Because in a classical game, uh, well, um, the play, but classical, uh, what do I mean by that is that the players are classical. When, when that's the case, then uh, the dimension of the Hilbert space is, is just one. So we don't have the room for growth that we need for compression to work. That is the reason why uh, the class MIP uh, equals NX, whereas MIP star shoots all the way to RE. All right, so. Uh, if I've lost you in the um, details of the compression theorem, now I'm going to switch gear and talk about something different. Uh, Self-testing. Self-testing is the most important ingredient in the proof of compression theorems. Um, at a high level, um, a game is a self-test uh, if uh, the optimal strategy is unique up to isometries. Um, I'll elaborate this uh, in a little bit, but um, just would like to tell you that every time we advanced our understanding of this concept self-testing, we were able to prove or obtain stronger and stronger applications. For example, better self-testing has led to better cryptographic protocols, verification protocols, stronger complexity theoretic bands, and so on and so forth. Uh, we will see uh, what do I mean by better self-testing. But first, let's see how uh, conventionally we prove this self-testing theorem. So you want to show that a game G is a self-test. Uh, you start by picking a canonical optimal strategy, S, for the game G. So that involves, uh, that means you have a Hilbert space H, a vector psi, and operators A's and B then you need to show that for any other optimal strategy, S hat consists of H hat, state psi hat, and operators A hat and B hat, 
there exists an isometry, V, that sends the hat strategy to the canonical strategy. But this isometry is uh, constructing is, is really a difficult task. It involves a lot of complicated uh, calculations. But what if I told you that in our work, we completely sidestepped the construction of these isometry. We didn't need to do that. And that allowed us to avoid a lot of these complicated calculations. And here is uh, the reason why, at least at a, um, at a high level. So let me tell you about the alge algebraic view of unself testing. So given a game G, I'm always guaranteed that there exists an algebra A with the following property. Every optimal strategy of the game G is a representation of this algebra A. Now, for a lot of the applications of self-testing, specifying the algebraic relations of this algebra, the algebraic relations between, say, generators of this algebra, is all that you need, including for our result. Let me give you a few examples of like, what this algebra looks like for some simple games. Uh, for example, in the case of CHSH, the optimal operators uh, always anti-commit with one another. So that's the algebraic relation. Uh, and in the case of magic square, uh, the pair of operators either commute or anti-commute, depending on which pair uh, you look at. There are many other interesting uh, uh, algebraic relations, not just commutation or anti-commutation. And what I'd like to tell you is that this finding this algebra, finding these algebraic relations is a much simpler task than constructing the isometry. In fact, to the best of my knowledge, uh, every proof of self-testing that I am aware of uh, first establishes the existence of this algebra, first specifies the relations of this algebra. All right, so now uh, equipped with this uh, algebraic viewpoint, let me tell you about the, you know, uh, I'm going to describe two of the important properties of self-testing in this language. Uh, but first, let's just simplify things a little bit because Algebras might be hard to imagine. Let's think about finite groups, okay? If you're lucky sometimes, uh, for a game G, there exists a group H that has the following property. Every optimal strategy of G is a representation of the group H. In, in such a case, we say that G is self-testing the group H. So for example, uh, the CHSH game self-tests the dihedral group of de uh, degree four. And the magic square is self-testing, uh, the direct product of the poly group with itself. Now, efficiency is an important property of uh, self-test. We say a game G is an efficient self-test for a group H if the size of H is much, much larger than the size of the game G. Intuitively, this means that a self-test is efficient if, with just a few questions, uh, it forces many, many algebraic relations, many, many group relations. Uh, for our result, we needed a highly efficient uh, self-test. The other property of um, uh, self-testing that is important is called robustness. There, um, we call a game G is a robust self-test for H if uh, every almost optimal strategy is an approximate representation of the group H. And for example, the MIP study cause RE result required a highly robust uh, uh, self-test and a highly efficient self-test. And uh, that, that uh, uh, really is uh, the most important technical part of their proof. All right, so let's talk about open problems now. Um, one is the obvious one that I told you. It's uh, what is the complexity of computing the commuting operator value of a game? Um, here's another one. Um, are there natural, other natural problems about non-local games that go beyond the second level of the, this hierarchy that I told you about? But there are so many more problems, especially about the self-testing. 
Look, we're just starting to learn about what's possible with uh, non-local games. What groups you can self-test, what algebras you can self-test, and, and we're starting to understand that it's con the connection of this problem, self-testing, with, with a lot of other fields, uh, representation theory, operator algebras, complexity theory, semi-definite programming, sum of square, you name it. Um, but uh, as for my talk, that's it. Um, I'm thankful uh, that you all uh, came. Uh, I hope it was worth uh, while your time. <laughs> Questions? Um, you can come up to the podium here. So, do you know anything about more than two players? Is it getting more complex or is, or is it equally complex? Um, so, more than two players is, is, is exact, exactly the same as a Pi 2. Um, yes, and, and uh, it's, it's not too difficult to see. That's the, uh, the reduction from um, computing the value for three players or any play, number of players, two pi two is, is simple. Just exactly the same as, uh, it's basically the non-committed polynomial optimization that I told you about. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. Of course. Hi, uh, it was a very interesting talk. Uh, I wanted to ask about one of the open problems uh, about higher levels of the arithmetic hierarchy. That's right. So you asked if there are any natural questions about uh, yes. games. Are there unnatural questions? <laughs> <laughs> Um, know so you can imagine uh, questions about two games, you know. Um, I don't know if the value of one game is larger than the other one. Then, um, or like, uh, for, a, for a given game, is there uh, a game uh, with, um, I don't know, uh, with better winning probability? Like, if you add more quantifier, uh, you would get, you know, you would uh, most likely get some simple questions that would go beyond. Kind of like polynomial hierarchy right, in the yeah. complexity theory, right? You just alternate these quantifiers and... You right. Do we know that them. these are complete or...? Uh, I don't know. I just made that up. But, All right. Uh... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, Thanks. You mentioned at the very beginning that there's, there is an explicit example of a game that, separate, that has a different commuting operator value from its uh, tensor, uh, yes. tensor product operator value. Yes. Um, is, does that game admit a nice description? Like the CHS, I'm sure it's more complicated than, than the CHSH game. Oh, but, it is uh, It is much more complicated than the CHSH. Uh, probably has many uh, hundreds of questions. And wow. Answers. Yeah, it's explicit in the sense that you can, you know, you can, uh, you can read their paper and, and see, it, uh, see it there, but it's just very complicated. It's not <laughs> like a, you know, combinatorial thing like CHSH. Okay, okay, it's just. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Of course. Are there any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Hamoon again for the great talk. <laughs>